Kalispera, good afternoon, and uh, I've, buenos dias. Um, we are starting. Oh, so glad we have such a good crowd for this, and we kind of fit perfectly into this room. So I'm glad we changed rooms and that you found the right room. This is the Open Ed Tech room. I even have an Open Ed Tech shirt the very first one in existence, which I, I had printed for myself for this session. Um, I, uh, so we have a workshop here, and I, the, the, the shape of the next 90 minutes is something like this. I'm going to talk at, at you for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and give you some background, maybe 20 minutes, because you know me once I get started. Um, give you the background where we're up to with Open Ed Tech. Uh, then we're going to split into six streams, and depending on how many people are interested in each of the six streams, we'll further subdivide into subgroups, like brainstorming groups. And then you guys are all going to be working quite hard uh, on the next stage, which I'll explain, and produce a summary of your group's ideas on one of these pieces of paper. I'm going to take some photographs of those pieces of paper and project them up here one at a time, and I need a representative from each group to come and just quickly explain what that group did. That's the shape. We've got 90 minutes. I think we can do it. At the end, we're going to have a terrific set of ideas that should really take Open Ed Tech to the next level. So, what am I talking about? Well, I've been so busy the last few weeks. <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't uh, prepare slides specifically for this, but what I, had, what I do have is the slides from the last Open Ed Tech meeting. Who here was in that meeting in August? One, two, three, four, five, six, great. The rest of you are not seeing things twice, but... Um, I haven't, pro I haven't progressed uh, much since August because of everything that's been going on. So, um, let me first of all explain. There, is, uh, there will be a very detailed explanation coming, a, um, a foundation paper, if you like. I had hoped to have it finished for, this, for today, but it's not. Um, but it will be soon, and it's not a manifesto, but it kind of is. Um, it's not a white paper, because you just don't say things like that anymore. And it's a foundation paper, and I'm looking for you to all help me finish this paper. As I explained a little bit in the keynote, Moodle itself, as, a, as an example of open ed tech, is, needs, a, needs a plan for the future. And the problems in the world are much bigger than just Moodle can do. What we need is, what I'm really seeing, is so many projects in education, uh, some that Andrea was talking about in Europe, uh, in the States, in, in uh, Asia, everywhere. Um, so many attempts to solve problems in education technology. And some of them compete against each other. Some of them are developed for a three-year project with funding, and they build something, and then it just kind of dies and disappears. And there is so many good ideas happening, but not a lot of it being turned into infrastructure that we use, that everybody uses. And it's all very well to come up with like the best blockchain system for micro-credentials and build a company to support that and put it on the internet and make it available. 
But it's not good if nobody can find it, if it's not connected to the systems we use daily, if it's not um, made so easy to use that your uh, grandfather, who's just done a wine course, uh, that his little credential he gets there, it doesn't end up in this system. And it doesn't even help if that dot, you know, if it's run by some company that disappears in three years because their venture capital funding ran out and the company goes down and then, oh, we've lost all of our data or we lost that system. So there's just way too much chaos in education, all of this stuff going on. And what I'm trying to do here is leverage the, the Moodle goodwill, the, the Moodle spirit, that is why we have 840 people at this conference and, and many thousands more all around the world, to leverage, uh, to use our influence in EdTech to push a new next generation of open EdTech. At this level, you know, we have a PHP application. It, Moodle is PHP. It's a couple of million lines of code that gets rewritten and changed and extended and built on over 20 years. Um, but, you know, think Star Trek. Think 100 years in the future. Do we all expect to still be using a PHP application with that architecture? No. Um, and if, and who here is more of a computer science nerd, tech nerd, more into the technology, keeping up with what's going on around us right now? Okay, I can see about... Oh, I would say 10%, 15%, maybe an extra 5% because you were looking at your phone and you weren't listening. Uh, how many people here are more interested in things from a pedagogical angle? They're more like teachers or learning designers. They're thinking about those human side problems. Again, another sort of 20%, probably some overlap, maybe 30% actually. Um, how many people here are more interested in sort of the administration? Just tell me what to do, I'll look after it. Like, they're, they're more like just keeping things running and, and actually the people keeping things working. Okay, a few hands going up. I know it doesn't sound as exciting, but life is 80% maintenance. You know this if you're married. <laughs> so, um, we have a good range of people here. Um, and, and, and the, the current stuff that we've built is not going to last forever. I, I fully think we're going to have a Moodle 5.0, a Moodle 6.0, and there's going to be a lot of new things happening with Moodle LMS as it is for these years to come. But we have to start thinking about this next generation, and that frees us up. So let's imagine that there is no... We don't, we're not constrained in this session by what Moodle is today. And I want us to put our brains together to think about what could be. What would be a global infrastructure that would just make education amazing for the next 50 years? Right? Why not? The, the residents of Mars will be using it. Because I think if we have a very good plan, the combined force of all of us promoting that plan around the world, with UNESCO, with governments, with companies, we can make it happen, right? So maybe five years we could have a good prototype. That's already three years now. Three years. <laughs> we'll have, we could have a prototype of this and we could keep it going from there, but we need the vision. One thing for sure is that it needs to be based on open standards. So you know about open source and open education resources. There is this concept of open standards. Open standards are standards that you can go and look at any time. They're open, obviously. But they also have an open process, a bit similar to open source, where new ideas and extensions and evolution of the standard uh, develop and they get um, the standards themselves are improving and, and continue. And W3C, uh, one of the big, you've all heard of them, the World Wide Web Consortium, they, they look after a lot of standards around the web. They're the custodians of things like HTTP. IEEE 
you may not hear about them much anymore. Um, I wish we did, actually, because, you know, every time you look at a, pe a plug, you know, that you put in the wall, power plug or light globes or all this electrical infrastructure, you know, this is the International Engineers Standards Body that have enabled that to happen. You know, you come to Spain and you plug right in, straight on the Wi-Fi, no problem. Um, they also have learning technology groups as well. They just, we don't hear about them very much. They've sort of become a bit quiet. We need to work on that. Anyway, these are the kind of standards we want to do. And I want to stress, I don't see open ed tech as being a standards defining body. I see open ed tech as us, the educators who are interested in openness, selecting the right standards, curating Right? We, 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 we are going to define what are the interesting standards that we want to support and recommend. So I, I'm kind of hating my diagram here because I originally drew it in about five minutes uh, and I haven't made a new one yet and I'm still using this picture. But um, these are the major components. So. I'm going to explain ideas I have so far around these and you're going to take it further. Now, if you don't like this diagram, you are very welcome to propose new ones as well. And maybe not today, because we have limited time, and I want us to focus on, let's see how far this goes. Um, but as part of Open Ed Tech, I'm very open, everything is open for discussion, and everything is, this is my proposal to organize our thinking. So, the first piece, whoops is the cloud. What are the problems with internet hosting and servers and things right now? The problem with servers is they require this maintenance. Um, you need people keeping them running. If a .com on which you are de relying for your services disappears, you lose your service. That's very disruptive to education. There are examples of more fault-tolerant ways of putting data into the internet. Now, I'm putting Web3 in quotes because Web3 is kind of a buzzword and has a lot of criticism as well. But what, this is the kind of thinking, though, that I'm talking about, is um, how do we store data in a way that we just push it into the cloud and it's completely safe and we never need to worry about it going. Even if a company disappears, an organization disappears, it's still gonna be there in 100 years. Right? That's a problem. There are some hints to a solution. We look at blockchain. Look at, you remember BitTorrents. Remember 10 years ago, probably a lot of you were downloading your movies illegally from BitTorrent servers, uh, torrents. Uh, where, was, where was that data stored? Everywhere. Like one movie, uh, the little bits of the movie are stored in thousands of servers. It didn't matter if half of them disappeared, you still got your movie. That's a good example of uh, federating, distributing data. The, the second part, which is not here, is about the CPU power. How do we store applications running out there on the cloud in a similar way? It's built for longevity, to live for a long time. It's minimizing risk. It provides a foundation on which to build everything else. Hey, yeah. um, it's not dependent on specific organizations. It is secure. It's free for users. So users should be able to store stuff free, because you want it forever. Well, if I have to keep paying money every month, it's not forever, is it, right? I might suddenly not be able to pay. So it's necessary, it's free, and it's necessary because also the lowest common denominator, if we want to think about educating the whole world, it's got to be free, it has to be. And the shared computing power. So that's some of the ground conditions for the cloud. The second piece is the education resources. I'm sure most of you know by now 
the entire world through UNESCO agreed in 2019 that OER, or open education resources, are the future of education resources. That means moving away from traditional publishing textbooks models towards open education resources. The world has already agreed to this. Governments have already signed up to this thing. The implementation is suffering because people are going, great, where do I put my stuff? And a lot of people are putting their stuff on a server that they run in different ways. Everyone's choosing something different and it's just kind of all spread out. So we need to, uh, I think, um, and, and, and the reason that's happening is because there is no clear leader. There's no clear solution. There's no open ed tech association going, hey guys, this is the way, right? We haven't, we haven't, that doesn't exist yet, so it needs to. And in there are some real problems that, that need to be solved. Um, how do we have standard structured formats for kind of high level data? This is more than just information. So Wikipedia is already a great source of open education resources, but it's just text and images. In education, we have a lot more things. We have lesson plans, and we have uh, less, uh, you know, um, quiz questions, and we have all this structured data. So we need kind of standards around how we share and store that stuff. The other really big thing is quality and accuracy. With AI, probably going to be generating 90% of the content in the future. Uh, how do we know what's real? Education is about our next generation knowing, you know, learning stuff. There's got to be a lot of quality and accuracy. I feel like the education system should be responsible for judging quality and accuracy. And part of that is a web of trust. There's no one of us who is a 100% expert on anything. So if I say that, you know, someone here is really good at Moodle, you'll probably go, well, you know, he's the Moodle founder. He's got a reputation. Probably he's right. So I'm using my reputation to put some weight on that recommendation. And all of you have expertise and can recommend some piece of data or a person. And so if you think about it, there's a web of trust going on. You know, why is Harvard University regarded as a good university? That's probably, and that's not a controversial phrase, but is it? I don't really know. Maybe it's just marketing, right? It might not be. Um, I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm saying I don't know what it is. So like there's, if, but if lots of people go, oh yeah, Harvard, it's great. Well, okay, there's a web of trust lending reputation to that institution. So I feel like um, that's very important to solve. And also that because we are proposing a kind of standard, we can start um, being part of the very, very many OER projects. So Andrea was talking this morning about some of those. I'm a, I'm a board member at Open Education Global as well, and there's 300 institutions producing OER as well. It would be so nice to say, look, just do it this way, and it's going to be in this thing forever, and it's like the, the right way. There's also curriculums, pathways, a lot, and it's just got to be available and usable by all. So not just teachers and educators and institutions, a student. You know, I have a dream that when you search for a topic on a search engine, as well as getting the Wikipedia page at the top, maybe the second one is, here are learning resources about that subject. And you go somewhere and you see them there. The third piece is um, the classroom. And this is closest to the heart of Moodle. And uh, you may be, from the, the keynote, I was saying Moodle Stuff can be in all these categories, but this is the most obvious one, that there's, there's got to be some kind of a Moodle next generation that inhabits this space of a, a space where an educator 
is creating an experience for many people and helping them learn. I'm a very strong proponent, and you may disagree in your groups, so feel free, but I think the teacher needs to own that space. I think when a teacher owns that space, they can develop it over years and years and years, and look, maybe they give copies to an institution for some reason, or maybe they have different versions of their space for different, so maybe they're connected to the University of Barcelona and they have a version of their classroom for that, but maybe they also teach uh, some webinars on the weekend and they want to have a version of the same stuff for that. So they need a space for teaching. We have to keep the human teachers in the driver's seat. With AI, it's very tempting to go, why don't we just let AIs do all the teaching? And it's possible, and it will be happening, but I'm very, I feel strongly we have to keep the human in the driver's seat, even if they're assisted by a lot of AIs. And why? Because education is the only way we pass our culture from one generation to the next. Are we going to let machines do that? Again, maybe you want to discuss that. Um, in there, AI needs to be working for us. We don't want to be working for the AI, but artificial intelligence is going to be super useful to help you manage lots and lots of people and make sure they all get a great experience. Um, that would give them feedback, give them assessment, giving you information, um, you know, summarizing, prompting, so much possibility. Your classroom could be public, your classroom could be private. It could support one student, it could support 50 million students. Uh, it should integrate all the teacher tools like Moodle does now, connects to many integrations with all kinds of other things. So the, yeah, this is where a uh, big blue button, for example, would be still an option. You know, I want to have a video conference, boop, we get my big blue button room. So it's kind of fitting in on this area too. It needs to be scalable and it needs to connect to organizations and learners, which are the other piece. Um, I'll get to that. The learner part, again, owned by the individual. We own our own space, not LinkedIn, not something the university gave to you. This is for life. You get one as a baby. Um, and you can store all of your stuff there in the cloud for free, for life. Verifiable credentials. Anytime you get a, a credential issued through some assessment, that's where it goes. Just boop in my connections. Um, this verifiable credentials, if you don't know about it, is one of the W3 standards that I think is really interesting. And it enables you to verify a credential. Right? Is it really from who it says it is? Um, and there needs to be a web of trust because, okay, it's great to know that the credential came from somebody, but who is that somebody? Is it actually Harvard University or is it somebody called John Harvard uh, who runs a shonky little verification service, a little, a little credential service? Um, so there's a lot that can happen in here, and uh, you know, I think uh, this will be a great one for people to explore. It's like, how does this system help you as a learner? Again, there will be AI in there, undoubtedly, because AI will be everywhere. We're going to be, there'll be more AI brains in the internet than human brains. We're going to be surrounded by these entities doing things. Um, so let's build it that way and have these kind of uh, intelligent agents that support us as a tutor. I would love for my system to know my timetable and have access to all of my data so that it can fit learning into my life. You know, I have two hours free and my watch goes, hey, you got a bit of time, why don't you watch this video? Why don't you do a bit of this, do a bit of that? And you go, oh no, later, and it learns starts fitting in with your schedule. So instead of going to a class or doing a timetable, which is very industrial, it's very last century, it becomes, education becomes a drip feed, a, a flow that you learn. And one afternoon you go, you know, I'm not happy what I'm doing. 
I really want to be a great architect. And your system goes, okay, well, I can help you be a great architect. Here's a learning pathway. There's a university near you. There's an online course over here. Um, and right now, there is this great augmented reality experience. So, you know, through your augmented reality glasses, you've now switched to learning to be an architect mode. It knows I'm in this hotel. It knows something about the history. I'm looking around. I can see. I'm very curious who designed this hotel, actually, because it's great design, right? So, you know, I would love that information to be flowing in around me, and I'm getting all this architecture information. And maybe I can see the stress level on that wall, you know, engineering loads and things like that. So I'm becoming, I'm seeing the world as an architect, augmented by my system. So this integration into your life, um, assisting you with getting organized and memory as well, because we all have, we're all designed to forget. So it becomes your extra memory. Assist you with employment. At some point you go, you know, I'd like to work as a, in the architecture field. And it goes, well, you know, here are some opportunities. It starts talking to firms and getting you jobs. Because it's interfacing with the organizations and helping you have different work. So that's that bit. It is helping you with this, right? Everybody, we're all looking at any given moment. I loved Andrea said we do 35,000 decisions a day, right? This is the decision. Where are we going to go in life, right? So that sort of sounds like a good job for an AI to help you with. But it needs to be an AI you can trust. Trust is very, very important here. Really trust. So you need to know that all of the, the technology you're using is working for you, not for Google, not for Microsoft, not for Facebook in some metaverse that's trying to sell you shit. It's like, this has got to work for you. And you need to trust it. And if you're a computer scientist and you go, can I really trust it? You should be able to look at all the code and go, yes, I can trust it. These are good systems doing good things. And that's why it needs to be open ed tech. The next piece is organizations. Um, that's kind of the rest of Moodle, right? The Moodle LMS and workplace, that kind of management of learning. Imagine, um, and there'll be many different tools here for different uses, but the organization needs to manage learning in a bigger way. I'm going to stop soon. Sorry, I knew I'd get started on this. Um, we. At Moodle, with 250 people nearly now, are facing real issues with who is doing what. And we want everybody in the organization to have a career path. And everything is dynamic all the time. People are coming and going and moving around, and you want people to. But I would love it if everybody had a terrific experience in our, in our organization and moved through. Every company has the same issue, every institution. There's all that optimization of how people can move around. That's something we could build a tool that would help with. Now, we could do it in Moodle, in Moodle Workplace, but we're kind of retrofitting it, and we are doing that in Workplace somewhat. But I feel like we could rethink this from the ground up. Like, what would be a purpose tool that would really help with that and use AI uh, very strongly to assist? That connects to the learners. So each individual, they connect their learner environment to the organization environment. So when you join an, a company and you become an, you know, a team member, um, the, the organization prompts you. You get a notification. It goes, maybe it's through your glasses. Hey, you've just joined Moodle. Um, Moodle wants to know. Shush. Moodle wants to know, you know, the company wants to know your name, your, your contact details, your, your gender, um, and some, something about your past. And you go, yeah, you can have my name, yeah, you can have my contact details. I'm not going to tell you what my gender is. It's not important, right? You can't have that information. And, uh, and I'll give you this selected information about my history. So for the privacy angle, you have control over your data as a learner as you interface with 
classrooms and organizations. And this kind of negotiation between systems and ownership, private ownership of data is really important to build in. I think I've covered that there. And the last thing is just you know, AI in general. It's, it's going to be an essential component. I am worried that AI is going to be developed by large companies with large agendas. Um, as a lot of people in this world are trying to farm us, right? We are the consumers being farmed and milked to feed money into some, uh, you know, put the milk, I'm lost, mix my metaphors, but all the milk is going into buckets and being drunk by people somewhere else. It's, it's not, not ideal, right? We need to own AI. Education should be driving artificial intelligence because if you think about it, what AI is, we are building brains. That's what we educate, right? That's what we, it's literally our field. <laughs> We're supposed to be experts with brains. So we should be experts with AI as well and, and using it in the best possible way. So that, we need to define it. And secondly, we need to also teach everybody how to live in a world that is dominated by AI. And that's uh, another problem. So that's my dump of the kinds of things I've been thinking about and the overall framework that I think exists. So there is an association I keep talking about. I'm not going to go into that. What we're going to do right now is I want you to run with that develop it further. Um, I've got some tables here. I want you to pick one of those things, and we're, gonna, uh, we're all going to have to get up, so get your, get your, put your devices away, get ready to move. We're going to move a lot now. Um, over here, I have the cloud row. Here is the OER row. This is the classroom row. The artificial intelligence row, the learner row. I think down the back there's the organizations. Um, it depends on how much interest we have. I might move them around a little bit. We, we can't all work, even if there's 20 or 30 people in each section, that's too many. We've got to get it down to one table. So there might be multiple tables of each of these subjects. So go. Let's get organized. So I'll say it again so you can just look. You need to think what you're most interested in. Um, oh, one more, one, one more thing. Sorry, one more thing. In your table, I want you to decide for that topic, are you working on it from a user interface view? So trying to imagine the experience Right? What does it look like? Maybe you can be drawing pictures of interfaces, you know, trying to imagine the experience of that thing. Like, what would be great? What would be ideal? Or are you working on the tech stack? Are you interested in the mechanics, on the engineering? Right? One of those two. So, look, I hope this works. Let's, let's do try it. So, cloud, OER, classroom, AI, and learner. Go. You've got a couple of minutes to get sorted. Let's see how we go. Okay. First group down here. Who's, uh, who's going to be speaking from the first group? No, no. Yep, you come up here. All right. I'll try and show this better. Yeah. Um, we could go, it doesn't, it, I think you could probably sort of see that. Not as good as I hoped, but that's fine. That's Look, okay. here you go. You've got one minute. Give us a summary. Okay. Okay, let's try this pitch. So, uh, yeah, we were focused on learners. And one of the key things we talked about was community of learners. Uh, we saw that in the connection of 
um, recognition, so recognition of learning, providing trust, because we were thinking of developing different learning pathways over a person's life cycle, um, and also that these people you know, this community of learners, they can also be providing recommendations for you, and all of this AI-assisted. So when we talked about AI to create recommendations, we were a bit skeptical, but doing it this way around made more sense. We thought of permanent IDs, um, and then we were thinking, well, we need IDs which are anonymous and flexible, so DIDs or something like that might be an interesting way of doing it. And we thought of one of the biggest problems, or two of the biggest problems with platforms, is a lot of the formats we're using are not inclusive. Um, for example, you need a, a keyboard. They're very, a lot of learning is very text-based, et cetera. Um, and we were also thinking, very importantly, and last point, about demography. I'm very interested, I was mentioning, uh, in the concept of the 60-year curriculum. If we think of this kind of learning pathway, which continues to continue, uh, continues through your life cycle, you have to think of how we can organize learning for that as well. That's us. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, this is really a full day session down in 90 minutes, so we're going to go super fast. But we can continue this conversation afterwards. Next table, please. I think we're going to go a little bit into the coffee break, but that's okay. Uh, next one is also learner. Here we go. That's your picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll give you another microphone. It's a good idea, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Jim. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, we, we did a lot, and I'm going to try and uh, con condense this. The biggest thing that we decided to talk about was the idea that it's all an iterative sort of a path, and that essentially, you know, you're, as a learner, and you've got a project, and it's, it's you, and you're going to be working on your learning that way. So we had this idea of, uh, you know, just kind of like the learner at the center, and there's kind of this spiral that goes around and around, and you're going to have many different iterations, and some of what you're going to um, want to, you know, you're going to want to have help along the way, and that the help is going to be different. You know, at different iterations and different stages, you might have different um, kinds of help. Sometimes it might be AI. Sometimes it might just be, um, you know, real human beings. Uh, one thing that we talked about was the idea that, you know, uh, you know, we're all focused on technology, but we've managed to teach each other for thousands of years without any phones or anything like this. And so a lot of this to us is like, what are, you, what are we still doing um, that we've always been doing and why do we want to keep on doing that? Um, and then just kind of part of that was we, we also have this piece here when we, we were talking about the idea of, of a LinkedIn that's more about a LinkedIn of, of a network of my learning and less about a network of other people. So it's all of the knowledge, it's all of the interactions, it's all the different challenges we've had. Um, and uh, we also put in the, the idea of competencies and credentials as a way to, you know, basically, you know, show evidence of what we're doing as we go through these different um, iterations. Um, uh, and I think I'll stop there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, I hate doing things fast, but also good, it's good. Table three, quick, get up here. Who's next? About the learner, they can't decide. We'll, we'll move to the next one if you want to think about it. Table four, do you have someone ready? All right, come on and help here. Table four. Is that the one? Oh, is it that one? No, no, stay here, stay here. I'm just trying to find your picture. Was, oh, you didn't have one. No, That's no, right. we, That's didn't, right. we didn't actually come up with the picture. Oh, we, went, we went wildly off into the future. Right. Um, <laughs> so we, there, there is no picture for ours. Actually, what we ended up coming up with was um, we don't think there needs to be a portal or a platform. We think we're going to ultimately have a kind of AI assistant, and uh, the way... I narrowed it down was actually a digital nanny that is with you from a very young age that knows where your skills and interests lie and then um, knows you quite intimately and then guides you along and gives you verified um, quality learning resources 
that fit to your own personal uh, learning uh, modalities or your own personal um, skill sets throughout life. Okay, great, thank you. Maybe you could still find an artifact. Um, table three, got someone? Got someone? Come on, come on. Come on, that, that guy there. I'm looking at you. You know who I'm looking at. Come up, say something. Come on, do it. You can do it. Yeah. You can't say anything wrong. It's all good. Okay, I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, you're good, man. You're so, good. okay. It was just a brainstorm, you know. Uh, we imagine uh, an application connected with other LMS systems. Mm -hmm. So, like uh, a cloud application. Yeah. This application should contain a student-driven AI, something like can su suggest you, I don't know, uh, something which is in your interest. Mm -hmm. He should have a gamification system. He should have even a system which suggests you something out of your interest, not like Facebook, that, you're con that confirm. Mm -hmm. And he should have a Q&A part, and you can have to have the possibility to find someone can help you to improve your knowledge. So, it was super. Brain All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Gabrielle. Thank All right. Uh, AI down the front. Yeah. It's got to be Dove. Come on. We all know you like uh, to talk. To talk. <laughs> Is this the one? No. No. Uh, yeah, that's the one. All right. I don't see anything, but okay, first thing I think we need to do looking at the future is from a research mark. perspective. Ah, yeah, okay. From a research perspective, if we, all of us would like to be creative and uh, create tools, we need to share data. What, this is the AI thing, half of it, the deep learning path part needs a lot of data. And I think we should standardize the way we anonymize data and share between us if we're going globally. For innovation, this is one thing. Um, the other stuff is, uh, okay, a lot of AI is biased with the data, feeding it wrong data or... Uh, talking too much? Okay, so this is another thing we need to consider. And uh, one, one more thing is um, we would like to have some kind of an assistant, AI assisting teachers, curating data or finding follow-up activities based on students misconceptions, misunderstanding, whatever, something that the nanny could also do from the previous table, I think. Did I miss something important, you think? No, I think that's plenty. That's ah, and explainability, okay, S sorry. One yes. more important thing. Very important. AI need to be explainable because most of it, it gives some output and the teachers get really scared. <laughs> Correct, yeah, thank you. Next group, ready, someone? I, I, I think we'll use AIs to explain other AIs. We'll have a, a stack of AIs all working on each other. Um, we actually considered this, AI to control AI. Uh, so basically we decided to have three columns. One was uh, collects the assessments, like what we consider what could be addressed by um, the weak points of, of education that could be addressed by AI, the perspective brought by AI, the changes, and then the keywords. And back down, pretty soon came the limits that we also considered. Uh, so in short, we see that there's some inconsistency in the way education is provided. We see opportunities to have AI produce more information to provide what we might call smartware. In other words, you have hardware constraints in an environment and that can lead to smartware. Uh, I'm trying to be short. And um, up to the limits where it would be so autom automated that there would be a real risk, including uh, government control and 
government abuse of yeah. through education in countries that are less democratic than the countries most of us come from, as far as I know. Yes, yeah, good one, important. Thank you, Cyril. Next group. Make sure you... Make sure you're ready if you're coming up that you're ready. Uh, Julia's been taking photos over here, so I hope we've got them all. Did we get them all, Julia? Oh, where is Julia? I lost him. Yeah, we got them all. Okay, cool. Uh, Laurent. Yeah, okay. We had a nice uh, discussion about what could be the student experience from the, if AI is used. Uh, we even came up with a slogan, invest your time, not your doing, not searching. And in fact, we thought about AI as a more personal trainer that was able to balance needs um, and interest uh, from the student's perspective. And yeah, I mean, a lot of ideas. One of them was also offer some kind of way of uh, upskilling people to um, get their competency for jobs that don't even exist and things like this. So it was, um, I mean, there is more in the in drawing there, but it's, it's, we look at it in a positive way. Absolutely. No, thank you. Look. I, are you ready already? I knew you see. I, thank you. That's, that's what I want to see. Proactive. Um, and I want to point out. Yeah. Right. There we go. Is that yours? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I could tell you a lot of things we talked about, but what I want to tell you is just three key points. One is that we see AI as a strong supporting role underpinning uh, admin developers, teachers and learners. Um, so a strong um, support factor. It has the potential to really disrupt the way we're learning. So we talked about, well, you mentioned, you know, getting um, stress measurements on walls and we said, you know, as an architecture student, you might be in a learning environment where the learning comes to you in the moment you really need it, walking up a staircase and the learning is there rather than in our, our space and time sort of um, bound ways that we're largely learning now. And the last one is that there's a massive ethical question around AI. And that one is to say, um, if we teach something to think independently, we need to be sure that we raise that individual, like our own children, in a way that they grow up and become the adults we want them to be. So it's incumbent on us all to take a moral and ethical stance towards the way that we train AI for the future. Beautiful, thank you, Kayleen. Hello, Raphael. So we went some card sorting activity and we find some kind of trends. Uh, is there a slide we have? Uh, it's the very U UX uh, 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 one. With yep. That one? No, that one? No. That one? E e I think yeah. so. Yes. Yes. So I have the notes that all of my table came with here. So. Uh, Learners, they need a classroom that the learning experience start from each learner's current experience and knowledge, and, and that understand that everyone has the potential to teach and to learn. So, uh, there's this really long one here, like, uh, need to feed diverse learning pathways that have led to the students to the success in the past in these AI data sets. Uh, so the AI can guide future learners along similar pathways. And human uh, teacher identifies success successful pathways and nurtures social and emotional health uh, in the environment. Uh, what else? Uh, it's probably in the learning One last one. Okay, acts like a GPS. Every student start uh, at their unique position. Uh, with their knowledge and skills, and the environment, which is the teacher and the AI, help guide them to the destination uh, with the most personalized and effective route. Awesome. Is that, is that enough? You've okay. enough. Thank you, yeah. Raphael. Thank, Thank you. you. And the group and the team. Thank you. Uh, Roland. Where are the next? Yeah, that's our ones. Yeah, we have been talking about um, the classroom, and we would like to see the teacher always to remain in the captain seat. He is. The owner of the content, he needs to decide on what uh, needs to be teached. We do see AI 
uh, help along with the learning styles of the learners, which might impact the selection of the content and how the content is delivered. We would like to see AI assist the teacher on the learning success, not only at the end of uh, teaching, but also in between, so things can be dynamically uh, adapted. And we can also, we would also like to see AI to help to personalize examples and quizzes and stuff like that. But, and that's the main point, we would like to see the teacher always to be able to control AI. And maybe AI would have to develop like PowerPoint. We use it as a tool in order to facilitate and support our teaching, but we always need to remain in the captain's seat. Thank you, Roland, very clear. Same team. Uh, Andrew, now, we are going to go a little bit into the coffee time, five, ten, five, six minutes. I'm sure you don't mind, I hope. If you really have to go, go. But uh, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so we... Oh, oh that one? We so we started questioning the assumption that tech is currently the limiting factor from an organisational perspective. We talked about the things that organisations own, like private data, the IP, is it the lecturer, is it the institution, the curriculum, the, they own the credibility, they own the ability to issue credentials. Why do they own those things? In a lot of cases, it's about money, and the ultimate outcome is siloing. So we need to attack siloing so that we have more empowered learning, shared content, more mobility, and, and we, we explored the ways that that could happen. We looked at public and private funding. Could we talk to B Corp and ISO to drive it in that direction? Can we set learner and funder expectations to, 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 to expect these things and demand these things? Looking at public funding, can we look at policy and procurement frameworks to attack it from that direction? Super. All right, thank you, Andrew, uh, and thanks to the group. The one group who chose the organisation. Uh, yes, you're next. Uh, Mr. Benetton. <laughs> Salvador. Yes, thank you. Uh, am I in the right area? <coughs> Hi. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, Look, we were me, me, about... me, me, me. Sorry, go. <laughs> we were talking about OER, and we actually didn't know where to start, so we look at the successes and the failure of the current OER repositories. And we ended up talking most of the time about trust because we, we, we thought that that's one of the main concerns. What's the content you, need, you, you have to trust? And we, we thought that in order to, um, uh, to, to define the accuracy of the, of the trust of the content, uh, you need uh, different sources for this trust. So we want to make it an open democratic process where anyone can, can, can give his or her opinion, um, but also uh, that it needs to take into account the different profiles of the person uh, giving their opinion. Okay? So that one was one of the points. Trust. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. And I pick another one. Huh? Pick one more. One more. Okay, no, 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 it's, it's just one, but three. Yeah. three. So uh, the, next, the next step is that we needed to define some kind of standard where everyone could work upon in a, in a collaborative way, and also to prepare some kind of collections with the contents, not only by people, but also from, from EA, uh, EA or for the trust system that we talked about before. So you'll see the little monsters, that's the AI, devouring everything, because we thought that it, it will devour everything. So, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, team. And Salvador. Uh, I think we're at the back over there. Who is at the back? Lewis. Am I right? Is that the one? No? They're in, the other, they're in the other order, aren't they? That looks more like something Lewis was involved in. Okay, okay so uh, we picked cloud and then wish we didn't. But um, we basically, a lot of this exists now, some of it. So we're thinking peer-to-peer -peer interconnections where everybody's a node, so everyone's carrying around a device and you're virtually, you're, you're the internet, so you're carrying this around and using more what we call near data processing, so that's done you know, on, your, on your device. Um, and then we got a bit sci-fi and we said, well, then we need some kind of super node that lives above all this stuff. And then we thought, why don't we put that in space? Um, not on Earth, so it's not the cloud, it's space. And that can all be, <laughs> that can all be powered by the sun. 
and then splitting all these different things like your personal data, work data, health data into decentralized cloudy thingies. And that's where we got to. Wow. So nice. thank you. Uh, it's always the kids down the back. I don't know what they were smoking, but it was nice. Good. All right. Okay, no. no. Okay, so uh, we did a list of what's important and some solutions, and we didn't make anything specific, but at least we think this is useful to get inspired by what's out there or what's important. So what's important is that it's uh, secure, that it's available and has uptime, a good uptime, that it's decentralized. Uh, we agree that it would be nice that it would be free, but we went into a rabbit hole of what's free, what isn't, so... Some ideas we had is the government backed, uh, that the European Union, or that nothing is free, so it cannot be free, etc. Uh, we should trust in its longevity, so if you have something in this cloud, you trust that it will be there for the long term, that it's based in standards, and the, that it's censorship resistant, right? And some of the existing solutions we can use to get inspired from is the Web 3.0 data, so blockchains, this kind of thing, self-sovereign identity, zero trust authentication, the interplanetary file system, the solid protocol, and the Tor browser, or the Onion network. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Some solid suggestions. Uh, thank you, Noel and team. Thank you. Diana. Well, I think all the cloud people drank the same drink of freedom. <laughs> Because I think it was the same with us. We thought um, it should be free, but it will cost something, so it should be self-sustainable, so we don't depend on anything. And it should be accessible to everybody in a technical way and also in a personal way. This is very important, and it should be free, easy, and transparent. And this is, uh, these were our two, three commandments, and we thought about a lot of examples where we have good ideas, and we should combine them and include them. And this is what we thought. Thank you. No, oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Next team, and last. But not least. Sorry. And I agree. I think we all either smoked or drank the same thing. It's all the clouds going on on that side. Yes. So we try to think about how to, to make a, the, the dream of having a, a, a place where does, everything can exist without ever dying so that it's always available. And one thing that we discovered is that we're going to have to change the way Moodle is constructed as it is. And we figured that we need to spread the different layers of what makes up Moodle currently into individual functional pieces, each one of them horizontally scalable ad infinitum. And we thought about that the, everything should be centered around the user's experience on whatever device they're on so that the course, the AI, the virtual reality, the Whatever tools that you're using to interact with the, the uh, content that you're trying to consume happens on your device. The only thing that ever gets synced up is the final result of whatever that you did. Think you're racing a Steam game and the, get the result of your whatever you want out. Same idea. That gets pushed out into what we consider the cloud that is, contains the user information that gets analyzed by an analytics layer, which is, which is basically powered by a whole bunch of containers. My note says crap load of containers. Um, and then, of course, there's Moodle.net, which contains all the courses, which are just courses. Think BitTorrent that you just download on your local phone. And Moodle sits in the middle in facilitating all that. Okay, that's an interesting one. Thank you, Galin. So, thank you, everyone, for participating. I talked about all of the trillions of neurons in this room. Um, so this, the outcomes here are, one, uh, I hope you all understand a little bit more about the concept of open ed tech and can see that you know, Moodle can go into this direction and be part of these things and it's bigger than Moodle. Secondly, I hope you are starting to have some ideas in here. It's kind of more important what was happening in our brains than on paper. Um, that maybe you feel inspired to keep thinking about these things and be part of it because what we're, ha what we're doing now, and I can't do this at the same time. Can I have this microphone? Uh, yep, that's it. Um, is 
come here. So come to the website um, and get involved in here. If you look under our work, we have working groups for each of these. And if you go in deep into it, you'll see there is a document and a matrix room for chat. At least come and join the matrix room and just hang with people in this area, or all of the areas, or any of them that you're interested in. All these pictures are generated with AI uh, a few months ago, so they look a bit primitive now. But uh, it's not easy to get a picture of uh, a, a learner with a tree growing out of her laptop, um, other than with AI. So do that, and also um, all of these bits, of, all of the artifacts you've created are here. If you want to keep working on them, or if there was uh, things, important things you think might get forgotten, please come and edit these slides. I've made a uh, QR code. If you, if you want, take that, go into the slides, add things, put stuff in there. And I'm going to be trying to synthesize, bring all that into the foundation paper and put that foundation, draft foundation paper out for comments to, to bring it together. Because we need one big artifact that we can start spreading around and get people on board. But the purpose of getting them on board is to take part in the working groups, to bring in experts in all the fields, to get them bringing their projects together and to start thinking about this and, and bring it together. I will be personally devoting more and more of my time to this, as we have a very uh, capable senior management team at Moodle HQ taking care of everything that Moodle HQ needs to do, but I'm, I'm really getting into the research side here with Open EdTech, so this is um, something I'm very interested in doing now for the next 10 or 20 years. Thank you for being part of this, and sorry about the coffee break. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>